I'm very excited to be here and everybody will actually speak at Paris. So this is exciting um, after being part of Paris for over 13 years. So it's pretty awesome. Oh, yeah. And I forgot to mention she was also president of Paris uh, just uh, two or three years ago. So I <laughs> forgot that part of the intro. Of the Paris. Uh, so I am going to be talking about radio embolization and how we tailor treatment. So I'm going to try to start off with the basics, but it's quickly going to jump into the, the deep and dirty of dosimetry. Uh, I am a, a equal opportunity consultant for both FDA approved radio embolization devices. So those are my disclosures. So when I was in training, one of my mentors really talked about taste as being a one trick pony. You put the stuff in and you hope it works. Uh, Radio embolization is a little different. And I would say, and some of you have heard me say this before, that radio embolization is the MacGyver of local regional therapy. Why do I say that? Well, look up MacGyver on Wikipedia. And what you will find is he, genius level intellect. We all need to know what we're doing when we're doing Y90. Proficiency in multiple languages. Right now there's two FDA approved um, devices and there's many more in, in, the, in this streamline coming up. Superb engineering skills, putting those boxes together. Excellent knowledge of applied physics, definitely. Military training and bomb disposal techniques, yes, please, don't want any spills. And preference for non-lethal resolutions to conflict, the whole purpose of radioembolization. So yes, radioembolization is the MacGyver of local regional there. So I want to discuss a lot tonight. And first, we're going to start off with just the basics of safe and optimal dosimetry. And then we're going to kind of delve into a little bit more about how to personalize um, your treatments and different ways of doing that. So let's talk about treatment planning. When you're treating a patient with radioembolization, you want to think of three things. You want to think about how you protect the lung, protect the liver, and how to optimize, not necessarily maximize, sometimes maximize, the dose to the tumor. So first, we're going to start off with the basics of protecting the lung, which most of us who do radioembolization pretty much understand. It's the lung shell fraction that we check. And so we inject technetium 99 MAA and see how much of it goes to the lungs compared to the liver. So MAA has a physical half-life of six hours, but actually in terms of lung elimination, it's about two to three hours. So you really need to get imaging pretty quickly after you inject it. And how does that work? It's pretty simple mathematics. You get the lung counts and you divide it by the lung counts with the liver counts, and that gives you your, your lung shunt fraction. So pretty simple math there. But lung shunt fraction is an overestimation, so I think we need to all understand that. But there's different densities to the lung and liver, so more radiation is going to come out, be detected off of the lung, which is less dense. And then MAA breaks down into smaller particles and, and goes through the capillaries into the lung, so that's, again, why you need to image quickly. Uh, and there's a bell-shaped curve with much smaller particles in MAA compared to the radiation beads themselves. Also, you can leach off free technetium as well. So these are reasons why the... The lung shunt fraction is generally overestimated, and a lot of the companies are working on creating a surrogate that, that isn't MAA, but actually the beads themselves. And in Europe, holmium wine, holmium wine, holmium radiomobilization is doing exactly that. So then we get this spec CT scan. Some places still do planar. In my early days of my career, we only did planar, but coming back to Penn, we're doing spec, which is really important. And I think the where people need to go, because that's when you can get the T to N ratio for personalized dosimetry, which we'll talk about. It also helps you figure out where non-target perfusion is. So we know that to protect the lungs, we need about limit the dose of 30 gray per treatment and 50 uh, lifetime dose to the lungs. But what happens when your lung shunt is high? So one, it could be an overestimate, but two, you can reduce your Y90 dose to get within that, that limit and give the Y90 then do another MAA and then give more radiation if you need more to get to the correct dose that you need. Or you could switch treatments and then if you need to go back in, do I need to repeat your MAA and usually it'll, it, the lung shunt will go down. You do have to remember to protect the lungs specifically for patients with lung issues, so COPD, prior lung resection, radiation. So if they don't have good reserve in their lungs, you might have that, that 30 gray, 50 gray might be a little different. So that's protecting the lung. I think that's the easiest thing we can do. Uh, and so now let's talk about how you protect the liver. So just the basics of it, you want to understand threshold dosing, like the underlying liver, when, how much radiation can it get before it puts? And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But also it's just where you're, you're treating. So I very, very rarely do whole liver treatments um, or, or even like one lobe, then a month later, another lobe. I try to spare, if I can, a segment or two um, every time because you don't want to wreck their, their livers. 
Uh, if there's tumor everywhere, I might actually even just do wh wherever there's the least amount of tumor, do bland or taste, and then do our 90 to the rest. Because you really want to protect the liver, especially if they have a lower reserve. Um, so, but if there isn't tumor everywhere, then don't treat the whole thing. Just go for that one area. Um, it, it's safer for the patient and it allows for future treatments as well. So now optimizing, not necessarily maximizing the dose of tumor, and that's related to protecting the liver. So in order to understand how we do dose, um, and, and do this, we need to understand the dosimetric models. And there's a bunch of them that we're going to talk about, but before we do that, we have to understand the lingo. Okay. And, and this is often confused or, or, or missed stated. So first we have to understand activity. Activity is actually what's in that vibe. It has nothing to do with the patient. It is the radioactivity of the radiation source. Dose, however, is related to the patient. It's the distribution of that energy, distribution of that activity deposited in a specific volume of a specific tissue. So that's, that's what happens inside the patient. So the activity is in the vial. The dose is what's happening inside the patient. Um, and so it's basically energy deposition over mass. So dose symmetric models, these are the most common ones used and, and we're going to talk about them. First is the MERD, BSA, partition, which more and more people are starting to use and voxel based dose symmetry, which I think currently is really in a limited number of places, but I, just, I think partition and then voxel based dose symmetry is where the future is going. So let's talk about the, the most common one. So, so MERD is the uh, single compartment dosimetry model. It is in the IFU of free glass radio em embolization spheres. And what, what it does, it accounts for the liver mass that you're going to treat, or like the area you're going to give the radiation, and whatever target dose you want to give to that area. It does not take into consideration the volume of tumor there versus the volume of normal liver there. It doesn't take into consideration the tumor to normal liver avidity ratio. So how much when you put the MEA in, how much brighter the, the tumor is compared to the liver. And it also doesn't account for the heterogeneous dose distribution within the liver or within the tumor themselves. The um, body surface area way of doing it is it gives you a theoretic normal liver volume. And it does, however, taking, unlike the mirror, take into account how much tumor is there, the tumor fraction that's there. Again, it does not take into account the T to N ratio or the heterogeneous dose distribution within compartments. So the BSA is an IFU of the resin microspheres. But you have to be careful with this because it, small patients with large livers, it's going to underestimate your activity that you need. And in large patients with small livers, it's going to overestimate the activity uh, that you need. So I actually get kind of nervous when I, if I'm using BSA and they're... Um, and, and I'm getting a really high dose and they're a very large person. I'm like, uh, I don't want to hurt the liver. So I actually also check out, do partition as well, though our, our group tends to do BSA. So partition, which I think is, is the, the mainstay future of this that should happen sooner than later, um, it is multi-compartmental dosimetry. And it accounts for the volume of liver that's going to be treated, the volume of tumor that's game going to be treated the T to N ratio and the target dose that you want to the tumor. You can also calculate the, tar the doses the, the underlying liver is going to get as well. And you can adjust based on if the liver is going to get too much or not. It, however, does not take into consideration the heterogeneous dose distribution within the compartment. So the, the liver itself, some areas might get more dose than others, but then the tumor, some areas might get more dose or more, more dose than others. And and that's where voxel-based dosimetry comes in, which is a computer magic that, that is currently beyond my, my abilities of doing computer work. But it is the future, I think. Um, so partition in itself is very labor-intensive. Um, and voxel-based dosimetry, I suspect, will be even more unless AI really helps us, which hopefully it will in the future. So those are the three slash four uh, dosimetry models that we mainly use. And does it matter? And the dose of fear trial, which came out this year, suggests that it does matter which one you're doing. Then you move more towards partition and personalized dose symmetry. So this was a multi-center phase two clinical trial, 60 patients randomized with large HCCs. And they did personalized dose symmetry with a goal of greater than 205 gray to the target lesion versus the standard glass dose symmetry, which is 120 gray um, using MERD to the perfused lobe. And their primary endpoint was objective response rate, which was 71% in the personalized asymmetry and 35% in the standard asymmetry. That's a huge difference. 
And the secondary endpoints are not powered to this was median overall survival, which also showed a big difference, 26.6 months versus 10.7 months. So this suggests that we all should be switching to personalized dose symmetry um, using partition um, and then eventually, hopefully, voxel-based dose symmetry. Okay, so we understand a little bit about dose symmetry. There's lots of ways to do it. Uh, there, there's better ways to do it and other ways to do it that still work. Uh, but now let's understand, like, what, what, what are we doing to the liver? How can we personalize this? And what are, we, what are those thresholds? So we go back to our mathematic days, our calculus days with these lovely sigmoid curves. And, and remember, residency physics, the deterministic effect of radiation. So you give a certain amount of dose of radiation, nothing happens, and eventually something happens, and that's the threshold dose. And then you get more and more and more, and eventually things are so dead that nothing else is going to happen. And that's the maximal dose or the complete necrosis. That's the top of the, the sigmoid curve. So when you're talking about radioembolization, think about when you're thinking about the liver itself, think about the bottom of the curve. The, the maximum tolerated dose predicting safety is that threshold dose when you start to get an effect. So, and, and that, what is that effect? That's a very um, not specific thing. It can, if you look at the studies, what that is and what, what is bad for the liver is, is kind of defined differently. So, so it depends on your definition of what is tolerated in the liver. Um, and then at the top, when you're thinking about tumor, you want to get to that point where it's all dead. So you want to be at the top of the curve for the tumor. Okay. And they're two different curves. So it's not one curve for both. It's two different curves for each. And so there's a lot of studies out there that looked at resin and glass and what the threshold dosing is. And these are the, these are the kind of ranges that they have. So resin to get to the tumor, you want greater than hundred gray, uh, for glass greater than 205 gray. And this is the, the minimum amount of gray you want in the tumor to kill it. So you might want more. Uh, so the dose, if you're actually try targeted for 250 gray, although they wanted it greater than 205. Um, and then the liver itself, the, the, you want it with resin less than 50 to 70 gray and with glass less than 75 to 120 gray. So why are these different? It's the same radiation type of radiation. Why are this different? There's different um, potential reasons. I don't think we really know, but potential reasons for that that we're going to kind of discuss as well. The part of it is what causes radiation-induced tissue damage? And there's three main things that that's dependent on. One is the absorbed dose. So that's the target dose that we are picking that we want to put into the patient. That is the target dose. Then the radiation dose rate, which is intrinsic to yttrium. So we can't really change that. And then the dose distribution heterogeneity. And this has multiple, multiple variables. And this is why um, this is where we can maybe kind of adjust things to, to change it. I and mean, I think some things are out of our control. But we're going to kind of go through dose distribution heterogeneity and talk about a couple of things that, that it affects it. But I'm sure there's others out there. This is not an all-inclusive list. First is heterogeneous vascularity. So within a tumor, it's not even vascularity everywhere. It's angiogenesis being crazy. So some parts are much more vascular than other parts. So so it's not even there. And when you put a radiation, if it's just like one vessel straight to the tumor, nothing else, it's still not going to evenly distribute because the vessels within the tumor are not the same. Variable flow dynamics. So there's heterogeneous tumor summing. You might have two tumors in the right hepatic lobe. One is much more vascular than the other. So this is what none of those um, standard dosimetry models took into account. Voxel-based dosimetry might, but the other ones don't. And, and so if you're in the main right and you're injecting one's more hypervascular, it might suck up all the beads and not much go to the other. So location of injection is also important, kind of for the same reason. You, you need to keep your catheter like kind of close to where you want to inject your MAA versus your, your treatment if you're doing a low bar, um, low bar treatment. Because if you move it a centimeter this way or a centimeter that way, the flow may be different and it might not come out your, where your radiation beads your itching beads go might not be the same place where your MAA went. And you have to be careful for um, vascular insult when you're in there. Uh, I tend to use it for treatment of smaller, the 2.4 uh, French catheters. And you have to be really, really careful. I, I know my, my um, residents kind of like, why are you taking over? Like when I see something uh, and it's very close, like we have to get super, super selective. I want to be the one spasming out that vessel. So you have to be very careful there because if it's spasmed, then, then you can't get the dose to where you want it. So how, how do you take care of this? I always um, test my flow rate with a low injection rate. So I do a good run and then I lower it down to see if it's really going to be um, not even where the flow is going to go. And then again, be consistent with your location of injections. 
if I can split the dose, especially if I'm doing low bore, I will split the dose for, and, and I'll show you why. Uh, using smaller catheters and uh, a lot of places they don't super select during the mapping study. And I've heard a lot of people say that over and over again so that they don't cause um, injury. I want to make sure I can get there before I order the dose. So, so I tend to, unless it's really a big vessel that I know I can easily get into. So this is an example of slow, slowing down your injection rate. So the three, three ml per second is on the right. And that's my initial injection. And then I, I lower it just to see where the flow is. And as you can see, um, we're missing a whole section of the liver on the smaller, on the lower flow rate. Uh, so there's something to import. If there was tumor there, then that would be an issue. In terms of splitting the dose, so here is, is a tumor that when, when I went into the anterior posterior, you can see the majority of it is coming off of the anterior of right hepatic artery. Uh, the posterior, small portion of the posterior aspect of the tumor is coming off the posterior artery. So if I injected from the main right, the majority of the radiation beads would go to the anterior and middle, less would go from the, to the posterior. So where is this person going to have residual disease or recurrent disease on the posterior branch? Because it didn't get good distribution of radiation because it all kind of went to the anterior branch. So those are things you have to think about and, and, and divide up. And I might do different amount, doses to each depending on um, even more personalizing it because th there's different amounts of tumors in each area of treatment. So then the other thing to think about is the specific gravity of spheres. And so glasses is heavier than resin. So resin is closer to blood. And, and some would say, well, then resin will go more even and, and go places more equally. And there was a study that looking at surrogate hepatic arterial systems and found better penetration with resin compared to glass. But then there's another study that shows with low bar treatment with glass, there is no difference in tumor response in the anterior versus posterior um, segments, suggesting that even though there might be a physical difference, there's not necessarily a clinical difference. Basically, we don't know. But that is the difference between the two um, products. Um, the infestate, what we're injecting the beads through. So uh, when these beads first came out, they were injected with water. So water is hypotonic. And it resulted in a lot of spasm and thrombosis, uh, which didn't let the, you couldn't get your full dose in for, for resin. So there's been lots of studies out there and some show that we can get better dose delivery with D5, which is in the IFU for resin or dilute contrast, um, which uh, at Penn is what, what some of our, my colleagues do because they wrote the paper on that. Uh, and with, with glass, we use saline um, with Resin is recommended not to use ionic solutions like saline because the way the, the yttrium gets onto the resin matrix is through an ionic exchange um, system. And so in theory, some there could be more leaching with that, although it is immobilized somehow afterwards. So, so understanding how they're made, if the glass and the resin are made, is also important um, to understanding why we do what we do. Specific activity of the spheres. So in general, glass has higher specific activity than resin. So looking at the, the, um, the numbers, so glass is calibrated on a Sunday and then they let's decay for about a week and a half to two weeks and you can treat any of those days. So on the hottest day, it's um, 2,500 becquerels per sphere. Resin on the hottest day, it's clinically available for use is about 165 becquerels per sphere. Okay. So that's a huge difference. But there's some overlap with decay because decay, when you, when you let things decay, you can kind of adjust things in the number, which we'll talk about a lot, the number of beads and, and what the specific activity is um, based on the decay. And I think there's some overlap of those curves at some point. Sphere size between the two is similar, but they're slightly different. And then what's really important for dose distribution heterogeneity, which I think is a huge thing that, that there aren't many studies about. Um, is the number of particles infused. And this is where we can really make a, make a difference. I, I really think the studies for this need to come out, but um, this is what I'm going to talk about a lot now. So what does that mean, the number of particles uh, infused? So you can have, let's say that blobby, cloudy thing is your tumor and the volume says so equal volume, equal tumor. You can have a 0.25 gigabecto point source times four or one gigabecto point source times one into the same, inject into the same place and they, in this case, go evenly if it's before and one goes where it goes. And radiation beads have like a radiation cloud on them. And you want to see where that overlap of that cloud is. Yes, the, the 0.25 gigabecquerel point sources have less radiation per bead, but 
they can overlap and cover more surface area versus the higher activity bead is missing the whole portion of the, of the tumor. So it's the same dose, but different number of particles leading to different effects. So these are some of the dose distribution heterogeneity factors that I think about. I'm sure there's others out there. And the things you can adjust that we can adjust as interventionalists are things with the, the flow dynamics that I talked about. And then the specific activity versus the number of particles infused. And those are very, those are inversely um, related between the specific activity of the bead and the number of particles. So back to our curves. So yttrium gives off its, uh, its beta F, um, emission to, to go into zirconium, stable zirconium, and the activity decays at a half-life of 64.1 hours. So if you, on time zero, you have a seven gigabecquerel activity, as, as the days go on, by day three, it might be three gigabecquerels. Okay, so the activity is getting slower, the same number of beads. So at day zero, before, it, before um, decay, it's a high specific, each bead is a high specific activity. And that specific activity of each bead decreases over time until it's a low specific activity. Okay, but stable number of, of spheres. A lot of us have seen this chart before, the therosphere chart. And the way the, the glass microspheres do it, they, they calibrate the um, beads on Sunday. And you can order a specific vial. And each vial has a mean or a, I'm not sure if it's mean or median number of, of spheres in them. And so depending on what day of decay you treat, you can, you can change the number of particles you get. For example, this is a really high amount of activity. Please don't ever inject four gigabecquerels into somebody, but it looked good on this picture. So if you want four gigabecquerels of activity to inject in the patient, you could potentially inject two million spheres for the same amount of activity and eventually dose um, on a Monday. Or you can wait almost a whole week on to the following Saturday and inject eight million spheres um, with the same activity and dose. Spheres is a similar thing. Um, with their flex dosing. So, but they do it kind of, the, they, their nomenclature is kind of backwards to decay. Um, so day zero was when it traditionally was day zero. That's when we used to treat. And about two years ago, they came out with flex dosing. So you can treat on day one, negative one, day negative two, or day negative three. So day negative three is the highest um, specific activity beat. And then day zero would be the lowest specific activity beat. So, Kind of this, this is pictorial version of saying that. So here's your decay and it's the same, this is resin, the same vial, five mLs of, I, I forget what's, I think it's water, but water with the, the beads. And over time, it's the same number of beads, but it's decaying. So depending on when you do your activity draw, you get, you can visually see less or more particles that you're injecting for the same activity, which will result in the same dose. So I actually saw this graph and a talk last week for the first time. And I was like, ah, oh, I'm glad someone's out there thinking about this too. And I, I kind of like mentally copied the graph. Um, but that one actually had numbers and stuff, but I don't know where the numbers came from. So this one doesn't have numbers. But there is some point where the glass curve and the resin curves are, are on top of each other, where the number of beads and the becquerels per sphere are probably the same if you're injecting them. Uh, where that is, I'm not sure. Uh, but just something to think about when you're thinking about which product to use. All right, so we talked about radiation-induced tissue damage being related to the absorbed dose, which is what we pick, the radiation dose rate, which is intrinsic to yttrium, and the dose distribution heterogeneity, which is a lot of variables. And that's how we come up with this, these um, threshold dosing. Uh, that's what affects the maximal necrosis that can happen and what affects the liver safety that's there. Um, and so... Why are these resin and glass different? Um, it might be that the radiobiology of glass and resin are different. And I, I, I really think we need to look at the study, like do the study on, is it related to the number of particles? Truly is it? Because most of these studies are from before there was flex dosing, before we started doing a lot of second week, although we've been doing second week um, glass for a while. Uh, so, so it's like, what, we have to go back and look at these studies and too and see like, we're doing more personalized dosimetry now. Does this still make sense with these numbers um, as well? And the number of particles, looking at that. Okay, so we talked about treatment planning. Um, so after you decide the activity you need, the desired dose, you do your dosimetry, you know what you want. 
And then you have to figure out specific activity versus number of particles. So how do we do that? Like where on the curve do you pick? And well, as I said, the science is not well established and, and there's many variables and we kind of have to, it's by experience, I think a lot and, and, and try to figure it out and, and talk to each other and get that information. So how do you know whether to use lower or higher number of spheres? So when would I have tried to go lower, which I, I tend to kind of push lower, but it kind of depends on the situation. So hypovascular tumors, I would use lower. Because if I do a lot of beads and it's hypovascular and it's not sucking it up, the majority of my mind go to the non-tumor liver. Smaller tumors, uh, I might go less spheres as well, uh, low, which is related to low tumor burden. Uh, small target volume. So when I'm doing segmentectomy, I don't want to reflux, but I want to get a lot of dose in there. And so I, I go for a first week uh, glass or a negative three day sur spheres. And then to protect the liver res res reserve a little bit. So if there's suboptimal performance status or liver reserve, I might lean towards using lower spheres because I'm trying to, uh, my, my mind is protecting the liver and slowing down the growth of the tumor rather than killing off the tumor no matter what and hopefully the liver will be fine in these patients. So it's kind of like, where's, where, how are you balancing the priorities there? And then compromised vessels. So if they've had a lot of treatment and it's going to be hard to inject a large number of spheres, then I might go to the smaller ones so I can get them in there. Why don't I use higher number of spheres? So very hypervascular tumors, I'm like, I want them to suck them up and sit there and spread out and kill off as much tumor. I do it. Larger tumors, same thing. High tumor burden. So these are kind of all related. Large target volume. So if I'm doing low bar, I might do a little uh, kind of do second week glass or maybe negative two. I still kind of use negative three um, resin. And then if their performance status and liver reserve is pretty good, the underlying liver function is not as much of a concern for me. And of course, if their vessels are look, looking good as well. So kind of switching to dosing and, and treatment intensification. So for radiation segmentectomy, lobectomy, when would I do that? Increase the activity and dose that I want to give. Uh, so large lesions that I, that I think that there's less non-tumor liver around it. You need low bar disease, um, good liver function in reserve. And when I want to try to get curative intent with segmentectomy. When would I think about decreasing the dose? And this is kind of, you have to be aware of what's going on with the underlying liver function. Uh, whole liver treatment. So I do a lot of colorectal patients who've had um, hepatic arterial effusion pumps. And sometimes I just did one last week where they ligated the right hepatic artery and then put the pump in. So I have no other choice but to do the whole liver. And I know the liver is compromised because they've been through multiple rounds of systemic therapy and um, hepatic arterial pump infusions. Um, so then I'm going to kind of go on the lower side of the dose. I just want to slow down the, the growth of the tumor, but I also don't want to kill off the patient's liver. Um, Bilober, small lesions, liver function, deterioration, or poor reserve. Um, everything just said. Oh, wait. I'm going to switch to just some cases and my thought process on, on them. So this is case one. It's a colorectal cancer patient. Um, prior to systemic therapy, they had posterior right hepatic lobe metastases, you know, PET. And they got the, the full theory, the first, their first uh, set of chemo and first line chemo. And then things started growing. Every, everything kind of went away. So this one lesion, which started growing. So they switched to full theory. But unfortunately, it still progressed on second line therapy. And that's when I was referred to this patient. So posterior right hepatic lobe lesion. Um, normal LFT is excellent performance status, <clears throat> status post chemo. So I know the reserve is a little low. And in a single FTG avid uh, lesion in segment six, but I know there was other surrounding lesions before, which kind of changes how selective I got. So uh, when I did the arteriogram, um, I got into the posterior right hepatic artery, which is the picture on the on the right there. I didn't get more selective um, because, I, again, I wanted to target that whole area in case there was the other lesion would start popping up. My cone beam shows that I got the, I was in the, the tumor was in the perfusion zone. So I, I did this with uh, resin, negative three day. And I, um, you want to target the goal to be like 100 grade to the tumor if possible and, and less than 70 grade to the liver. Uh, with, the, with that thought process of protecting the liver and maximizing or optimizing, not necessarily maximizing dose to the tumor. The patient did really well. Um, and you can see uh, tumor shrunk from three centimeters to 0 0.9 centimeters um, in over two years. 
So I, I so it really responded well with that treatment. Um, case two is a uh, intra intrahepatic cholangiac carcinoma. Um, this poor patient had no history of chemotherapy or liver disease and had abnormal liver function tests, and they found this 8.4 centimeter right hepatic lobe from satellites, um, no extrahepatic mess. So I did a low bar treatment, and for low bar treatments, I want to do, uh, I tend to treat Friday, Monday, or Tuesday, uh, Friday of first week or Monday, Tuesday of second week, whichever one I can get the patient in for. And sometimes I have to adjust it based on the dosing that I want to do. Gold tumor dose of greater than 205 gray. The majority of the liver here is is tumor, or the majority of the volume is tumor. I'm not treating the right the left lobe, so I know he that there's otherwise healthy underlying liver there can probably compensate if I go off the right lobe. And I did separate this into anterior and posterior. I put a higher dose um, in the posterior because that was the majority tumor in the anterior because there was some regular liver there and less tumor volume there. And you can see um, tumor shrunk um, significantly at, at six months uh, it was it, it, it there. So it hopefully gave them some time. Case three is um, HCC. Uh, this is a 2.3 seg centimeter segment two Lyrads 5 HCC. And unfortunately, there is also um, left portal vein tumor thrombus on this one. Okay, I can see it there. So did the MAA and um, got really good tumor thrombus um, targeting there. And everything was coming off of the lateral left hepatic artery. So I did, we did traditional segmentectomy here. So did calculated 180 gray glass <laughs> to the entire left lobe and put it all into the, into the lateral um, left lobe. Uh, now I probably change that a little bit and do more personalized dosimetry, just focused on the lateral lobe, but this was a while ago. And um, did pretty well at 80% uh, necrosis of the segment two at three months and 40% necrosis of the portal vein. But there was some portal vein tumor into segment four now. So brought the patient back and retreated the whole left lobe at a standard dose, 130 gray. Um, ideally, if it was doing personalized dosimetry, which it didn't do at the time, be greater, or greater than 205 gray. And for a low bar dose, I, I want to do, I tend to do Friday or Monday treatment, um, maybe Thursday, Friday, Monday um, for, for glass. <laughs> so three months, no portal vein, tumor contrast enhancement. So they did really well, um, decreased diffusion. And they remained from very good performance status and liver function for about 15 months. But then they started to deteriorate and they died um, 23 months post initial diagnosis, 21 months after first um, Y90, which is significantly improved compared to what we've seen in the Asia Pacific and SHARP trials for macrovascular invasion. So with placebo, patients would die of me mean overall survival of four to five months and serafinib, I uh, mean, overall survival of six to eight months. I mean, now we have a TZO bed, but we don't have the data on that yet. That hasn't been published in the mac macrovascular invasion. Okay, so I discussed a lot and I probably went faster than I thought I would. Um, we talked about safe and optimal dosimetry. We talked about the dosimetric models. We talked about threshold dosing and what the things that go into um, killing off tumor. And so absorbs dose or killing off anything. Absorb dose, dose rate distribution, heterogeneity, and how we can personalize things based off of the things we can affect for heterogeneity of, dis of dose distribution and the inverse relationship between specific activity and the number of spheres that we can actually infuse and how we need to think about the number of spheres that we're infusing. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Susan, for a wonderful presentation. Um, one uh, question here texted to me, and then we have some from the chat. Um, so uh, when you talk about the different models for doing those uh, those dosage calculations, what do you think uh, has been the limiting factor to partition? And are you able to make use of uh, technologists who are able to do those tumor volume calculations and liver volume calculations? Or is this something that you do as an operator yourself? So, so that is the biggest and the biggest challenge is getting used to these, um, these programs. They are <clears throat> like, I still am not used to it. We unfortunately got one in the height of COVID. So I had to learn it using Zoom and I basically couldn't even log on to Zoom correctly. So you want me to figure out how to use this very complicated <laughs> oh, program? 
And, and so that's, I, that is a definitely limiting factor. And I think where we can do the best with it is to train technologists to do it. So if we have like multiple people doing radio embolization, rather than all of us doing it separately, we're having one person do it all, they'll have more volume, they'll be better at it. Uh, rather than us doing like me doing like a couple a week versus somebody doing like seven or eight a week, depending on how many people are giving them the, the stuff to do. I think it, it will make it easier um, and more efficient. And it's the way to go, is my thought. And in, in the follow-up question there is, do you know, and perhaps somebody in the audience can put it in the chat if they know, but is that a separate billable code in terms of the doing those dose calculations? Because uh, one of the things that has been brought up to me by other people out in practice is that well, at my institution, you know, the radiation oncologists do these dose calculations and feel that they should because they know how to run this kind of software or whatever. Obviously, we don't want to, you know, give up those skills or give up that opportunity to be, you know, more involved in the personalized care of our patients. So I'm wondering if you know if there is a reimbursement code for our technology. I'm not, a, I'm not 100 percent. No, so we do volumes now and our technologists do it. And then I, um, I dictate it so uh, we're billing that and I, and because uh, because even if a technologist does it you're reviewing it so you're the doctor reviewing it and doing the dosimetry and that i believe is a is a billable event um the the reps would know the best or your financial people but i know that when we are at as an au i bill for the nuclear medicine aspect and the um, actual procedure aspect when when we're doing them Okay, and someone did put in dose planning is separately billable and the 3D volumes could be billable through a 3D lab. So there's kind of perhaps some other answers out there for people. Another question that came in was regarding kind of how do you protect the cystic artery or how do you manage that? Do you care about it? Do you do coil embolization of it? Or how do you how do you deal with cystic artery flow? So you don't want to embolize it. I think there's been studies showing that embolization leads to higher rates of cholecystitis than radiation um, cholecystitis. So it's not something I worry about. I mean, obviously, I like to divide my dose. So if I'm dividing my dose, if I can get past the cystic artery, I definitely do. So that's another advantage to dividing your dose if you're doing low bar treatments. Uh, if yeah, I don't, this is just like hearsay. I have no um, evidence for this, and I think I'm the only one in our practice that does it. And it's it's a it's a vestigial thing I do from fellowship. Is I put patients on um, cipro for five days if the cystic artery is in the way, and I think that helps me more than them. So. Uh, not, I know none of my, like Stephen, you don't do that, right? I don't think my other colleagues do that. Uh, no, and I, I do know that there is a literature out there on coil embolization of cystics. I don't do as much Y90 as you, so I don't have that experience. But um, I know that there are some publications that I've, I've shared with the rest of the group about, you know, our group about that. So it's a, it's a known thing that people do. But whether or not the, you know, mild cholecystitis you get from that is any worse than what you would get with radioembolization. I just don't know the answer to that. And I, I doubt it's been studied in any kind of randomized controlled way. So, um, I agree. Right, any other, any other questions out there, folks? Sean, do you want to say anything here? I actually have a question. Um, so, uh, it was a great talk. Thank you very much. It really ran into the basics in a comprehensive way and sort of how to specify everything. Uh, my question is, there was the case that you talked about where um, there was a residual tumor in the posterior portion of the, of the uh, I guess, the treatment zone. And then you went back and treated the patient again with Y90 shortly after. Is there a, a, a time frame that you sort of adhere to, you know, based on the follow-up imaging, whether you're going to decide to retreat or not? So, okay, it's very personalized. So in that patient, it was the, the portal vein tumor thrombus patient. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. The radiation segmentectomy to the lateral left hadn't touched the medial left. Okay. So I'm already killing off the lateral left. And if I'm going to treat the whole left, I don't really care because I want it dead. Right, so, right. So decrease the dose to, to not a segmentectomy dose for the medial left because I wanted the patient to have a little bit of reserve. Okay. Uh, and that's, that, that was the thought process in there. So it depends. So it really depends. I, if I'm doing a large volume, I'm very hesitant to retreat with radio embolization within a year or maybe a year and a half. Okay. Uh, and they really have to be had pretty good liver function for me to do that. Uh, cause I've seen, I've seen livers kaput and, and I don't want right. to, I want to 
do nothing versus prolong the life rather than journey. <laughs> so, so that that's why I'm very, very safe with that and very safe about not treating the whole liver if I can with radio embolization. Um, can you expand another question? Can you expand on um, the hypovascular tumor settings, uh, maybe some of the colorectals or other metastasis where you're not seeing it? Um, yeah. When you're still looking at the high tumor ball, high tumor burden, you kind of end up in these situations where you have a high tumor burden, but none of them are super vascular. How do you deal with those kind of uh, situations? Yeah. So it, I, I kind of, again, I want to spare as much um, non-tumor liver as possible. So if there is one area that has more tumor, less non-tumor liver, I, mean, I split doses and I, and I might give more beads to that area. And then the other areas, I might cut back a little bit. Again, it really... Um, it's hard. And I think that's where personalized asymmetry comes in. Uh, once we, everyone starts doing the T to N ratios and using partition, then you'll know, we'll know better how to protect the underlying liver. And, um, and then in terms of beads, like I, I, I think that's when we'll have to figure it out because we're changing the way we're treating patients. Um, but again, if it's more tumor and less non-tumor liver, it might get more beads um, to, to get a better distribution of the radiation into the tumor. But if it's like a less to like the tumor amount of tumor to the amount of normal liver is is not as great. The more beads I give, the, in my mind, the more I mean, I don't know that the actual evidence by it, but in my mind, the more radiation is going to go to the non tumor liver in a hypovascular mass. Do you ever use flow directed catheters, you know, TriNav or uh, any of the other devices out there for, um, you know, yeah. for trying to increase uh, delivery? Yeah. So the, the theory is out there that you, that you use them and then the perfusion changes it and it goes, I have, I have limited practice with them, but the couple of times I have, I didn't get that. And so I have not been regularly using them. You're, you're muted. Steven, you're muted. Hey. <laughs> I said, that I don't see any more questions here. So thank you again for. I, I actually have one. Oh, go ahead, Sean. <laughs> Sorry. This is very uh, thought provoking, but, um. So last year I did a lot of 190 at Jeff and I noticed that we were doing the flow mapping, which I think is really cool how you do the, the dual velocity um, from the same position to kind of see where preferential flow is. And I kind of remember, and maybe I'm remembering wrong, um, but when we're instilling the beads, it's always at a regulated rate based on the company, right? So when we're injecting through the, the uh, syringe. So why is it that during the flow mapping, we don't try to mimic that same rate with contrast to see where the preferential flow is? I think the viscosities are very different between the two. Um, that's and, true. Um, but I think that's where these companies are looking at the, the beads. So there, there's, um, I, I think it's called I-90. Um, I'm blanking on the name suddenly. In Canada, there's a company there. that's And then Holmium um, beads. That, that they're using the actual spheres themselves instead of MAA. And then I, I don't know how either of those companies are planning to inject those in the mapping, um, but I wonder if they're going to try to mimic the rate. But then you also have to mimic the amount of tubing you have, the size of the tubing. Like there's so much to mimic. So I don't think it'll ever be perfect, but I think it'll be closer when we have those surrogates. And definitely many of the vendors are trying to simplify the in injection devices. Um, and the more you can get it towards just a syringe based system, you know, loaded with a, you know, with your radiation, then, you know, the more you'll be able to get those two procedures to be similar, you know, but, um, um, but we're, we're out of time and thanks again. And, uh, look forward to next month. You'll be seeing the email come out about our next speaker. And we have, uh, I know Sean has been working feverishly and getting our winter, uh, you know, our winter party together. So he'll hopefully have us, have us an update about that. Um, but, um, but yeah, thanks again for everybody who showed up to our last uh, kickoff and we're, we'll hopefully have more uh, social events as the, uh, you know, as society is opening up. So thanks again, everybody. And have a good evening. Thanks for having me. And residents reach out, get on the board. There's lots to do. And also medical students, Saturday um, symposium. You can email us if you, if you don't have an invite. Thanks a lot. Thank you.